Welcome to Disrupt Education, the podcast about disrupting education. I got a major player here, Austin Allred. Uh, Austin, how you doing, man? Doing great. How are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing wonderful. Uh, it's almost been two and a half years to the day uh, as this recording. Um, you are wow. on. Uh, you are building uh, and moving, and now you are the CEO of Bloom Tech. Um, tell uh, the audience a little bit more about who you are and what you're doing, man. At a high level, uh, we train people to be data scientists and software engineers uh, with no upfront tuition and a tuition refund guarantee on the back end. So, you know, basically, we're trying to align the incentives of the uh, educators with those being educated, where you know we're. Uh, we can't be successful unless you're successful. Um, and that's a little bit different than the way things are traditionally structured, but we, we like it that way. You, you are definitely the, the trailblazer. And I'm actually going to put the link to the first one way down uh, so people can kind of see the growth. Um, as I teach entrepreneurs, um, you know, the, the entrepreneurship mindset, it, it has been a wild ride. Um, and I, and I, we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, before we do get into that, um, everybody has their own educational path, their story, who they are. Um, and I always like to ask the question, what type of student was Austin, right? I can see it, like if, if people are watching on the video, they can see a smirk a little bit because this is always <laughs> a fun question, especially for entrepreneurs. But in the classroom, uh, what kind of schools did you go to and, and you know, how did you get through that? I went to a standard, I mean, I went to public school um, and I didn't even know there were there, I didn't know there was anything else. <laughs> I thought everybody just went to public school and that was it. Uh, until I moved to the Bay Area, I didn't realize there were people who didn't just go. I mean, other than like on movies where you see people in like Catholic school or something. But uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, very, when we, went, when we moved to the Bay Area, everybody was super obsessed with like all the rankings. And um, we were in a town that, all the schools were rated nine and people were moving across town to go to the school that was rated 10. And that was all completely foreign to me. And so me and my wife looked up our schools. I think we were a two and a three respectively on the scale. So, uh, you know, lower middle class working family, you know, public school. Mm -hmm. And what kind of a student was I? I was a freaking terrible student. <laughs> it's, it's the short answer. Um, I think my senior year of high school i skipped class more than i attended i had uh, i was able to graduate because i was on the student council and i was on a couple of teams so enough of it was justified that um you know i could graduate but only just barely um that said i had you know really good grades and really good test scores i just didn't go to class um yeah. which you know, tells you a little bit about the way that i viewed education at the time and, and view it now to some extent um uh, you know, very focused on the outcome um, and more flexible on the inputs of getting there than some other educators may be, which I think has probably paid dividends in the, in the long run. As an educator, right? Like I get, I, I have students like you, <laughs> which are, they, you know, it drives some uh, educators nuts and not like, was there, was there one, maybe a couple of educators or somebody in, in the system that was like, yo, yeah, I see what you're doing. It's all good. Uh, or was it all like, no, you have to come to school and you, you had to do that fight all along. Yeah, there are a couple. Um, I mean, I remember in sixth grade, there was Mrs. Lawrence and I don't even know that I'm sure she wouldn't even remember who I am. Um, but she was like, just, I guess, you know, accepting of whatever way I wanted to do stuff and however I wanted to learn. And, you know, hey, as long as you're doing X, Y, Z, that's, you know, it's up, up to you. Um, and then I had a Spanish teacher. I took uh, five years of Spanish um, and actually spoke it pretty well. I mean, as well as a, someone who studied Spanish in high school can. <laughs> uh, and then I moved to Eastern Ukraine, spoke Russian and forgot now when I try to speak Spanish, Russian just comes out. Um, but Mr. McDonald, who's our Spanish teacher, our AP Spanish teacher was just, uh, you know, he was, he wasn't interested in, you know, we, we weren't just going to sit there and do workbooks and stuff. We were going to watch movies and read books and debate stuff in Spanish. And that, that just really resonated with my learning style. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I skipped more class than I attended and I, Kept good grades throughout, uh, decent grades. I'm sure they could have been better, but 
you know, always on the honor roll, got into good college, uh, just didn't go to class. Did that, did that transfer over into college as well? I mean, did you play the game in college or what was that like? Yeah. So I was, so I, the only way that I could not be super bored in high school was by taking AP classes. Cause I found that they like pushed me. So in my senior year, five of my eight classes were AP, which I had to like get a special exemption for. Um, so I, and then I, you know, learned to speak Russian and tested out of a bunch of Russian stuff. So I started college with basically as a junior, mm -hmm. um, I didn't start college until I was 21. That's when I came back from Ukraine. But I only had all my generals were basically knocked out through AP and um, other stuff. Um, and so, but by that time, I was you know pretty much I was working full time and going to college where I could on the side. So I never had like the true you know 18 year old freshman college experience, and I, I don't know that I would have cared for it either. Um, I was kind of already doing my own thing. Um, and then after what was my second semester of college, you know, I only had a year and a half ish left. Um, I was, I was basically not attending. Um, and I was trying to start stuff on the side and I went to a guidance counselor and was like, Hey, you know, I'm thinking about taking a semester off. And she was like, if you take a semester off, you'll never come back. I was like, no, I'm just like, I'm going to take a semester off. I'm going to work on some stuff on the side. Um, and she was right. I never went back. Um, but it worked out. So as a results-based learner, right, um, it doesn't fit in the system, but you've built something. Like you've built the, uh, the where the accountability is on the graduate's results, not on a piece of paper. Talk about Bloom Tech, man, and, and you know, how, how far it's come. Uh, over the the couple of years, and and how is it? W w what is it? And then what it, what does it offer? Why why is this different? The two minute version is you know. So I when I took a semester off of college, I I moved out to the Bay Area. I lived in I had a little Honda Civic that I lived in. I taught myself how to code, and I got my first job really that way. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I would go back to small town Utah, everybody would ask me like how. You know, how can I do that? And realize that that was a pretty intense and difficult path for the average person. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, originally we were like, well, let's just, you know, we can teach people to code online. Let's just do that. So then they don't have to move. And that was the entirety of the goal and the vision. Um, and, you know, I knew nothing about instructional design. I knew nothing about education. Um, three of my four grandparents are teachers. My wife was a, was teaching elementary uh, in a public elementary school but other than that you know i had no my my only experience of class was trying to get out of it um so we you know we started just a very basic you know let's teach people to code online and pretty quickly learned that the incentive alignment was kind of the key to unlocking everything um, and then along the way you know got a really quick uh, master's degree and PhD in instructional design and curriculum development um, by hiring people who are far better than I will ever be at all of that stuff. But um, you know, now I can talk endlessly about curriculum design, development, instructional design, and how to build a really phenomenal online school. But we kind of just stumbled our way into it and made all the mistakes that you can possibly make. And now the experience is pretty phenomenal. I think we've built something really special. I have students come to me all the time who already have the go, the, I'll call it the Austin attitude, right? Like I want to create something. I'm, uh, I have kids who have certified themselves as juniors in high school. Um, and they, they just do it outside of classrooms. Um, and they still, their parents still want them to go to a four year. Uh, and to me, that's mind boggling. I, I guess I get it, but these kids really know, I'm speaking of the kids who really know what they want to do at this moment, right? They what they want to do, uh, you know, some back end work. They want to, they want to learn and, and continue in the growing of the computer science area. Um, and they don't want to go to college, but the parents are like, well, you got to go to a four year and get that degree. What? Why? Why are things like that? So why is it still like that? When I dropped out of school, my family staged a full-on intervention. Like there was a family dinner 
and everybody sat around the dinner table and told me why they thought. And you know, I, I think from my parents' perspective, it's it's interesting because it wasn't like it wasn't just, hey, will you be you know successful one way versus the other way? There was certainly an element of you know you won't be able to get a job, but you know, my, my counter argument to that was always, well, if that's the case, I can go to school later, right? Like it's not a, it's not a one way street necessarily. Um, but there was also an element of, you know, my parents worked insanely hard just to have the opportunity to go to college. And my grandparents were, you know, first generation college grads. And my wife is actually a first generation college grad. Um, and so I think in the eyes of some folks around the table, I was rejecting the opportunity that they had worked so hard to give me. And it was as much about, you know, I mean, if you historic and my, my family's very into to family history. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we know all about our ancestors and all about, you know, their stories. And it was like, so you know, my my mom will tell you the story about how her grandpa you know had the chance to go to NYU and had very little money and lived on bananas or something ridiculous for a month and ended up having to drop out because he couldn't afford it and he worked construction and ended up you know with a construction company and like now I had the chance to go you know and I, my parents didn't pay for my education but it would have been you know, relatively affordable. And I was rejecting that, right? I was saying no to the opportunity that they would have killed for. And so I think some of it is, um, it, it's, a, it's a few things. First is for our parents' generation, college meant actually, I'll say for my parents' generation, but it's true for everybody, college was meant something different than it does today. And it was a different type of opportunity than it is today, where you know, when, when I was in high school, all of the conversation was, look, if you go to college and you get a degree, like you have paved your way in life and you are set and you are guaranteed a great job. And so all that matters from an educator's perspective is get into the best school you can, study what you love. Oh, my gosh, I wish I would have done that when I was your age. Please, kids, listen to my you know elderly advice that like that's that's the ticket unfortunately between the time that that was true for the people who are giving that advice and now the game changed a little bit right now going to college is not a guarantee of an outcome it is not you know there are many many people who are you know there are thousands of janitors who have phds in the united states like it is not a, a guarantee so it may it, so that changed over time, but the cultural perception is always a little bit slower to catch up. Um, I get in trouble at times for saying, you know, probably in many instances, parents aren't the first place to go to for career advice. You should talk to somebody who is just fresh out on the job market because by virtue of, you know, if your parents were working when they had you, their advice about breaking into an entry level career is probably 18 ish years out of date. And it may be true, but it may not. And, you know, I think about that for myself. Like if I tell my two year old, Hey, just learn to code and everything will work out. That may not be true 20 years from now. Right. And we will want to adjust, um, according, you know, as the market may shift. No, I hear, uh, I hear the, that, you know, I like that you eloquently put the parents or the the generational kind of look. I mean, we can tag it and say, all right, it's it's a millennial generation or whatever people want to want to tag that generation. But we get a lot more parents now that um, are coming through who did not get that quote unquote happy, great. Hey, look at me, I got a degree job. Um, and that's changing the perspectives. And I also still have people in my own generation like you're way radical, and I'm like people aren't seeing it. What do you What do you see in the next, you know, five to ten years coming that with the parents? Um, because I'm seeing more and more like, hmm, let's take a look at something else. And schools are slowly starting to to do that. Um, what? Yeah. What? I mean, this isn't. When is this coming? What do you see in the next five years with these parents? Yeah, I mean, it, it's. 
it's interesting when when we started five years ago, you know, and and to be clear, I'm not anti college education yep. per se. Like there's there's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. The the error people make is assuming that that's the only path or the right path for everyone. So they're like, if you want to be a doctor, absolutely go and get a four year degree. I right? think like that's literally the only way. Um, but there, are, you know, there's all sorts of middle ground. What, what I but what I have noticed is that, you know, five years ago saying, yeah, you may not need to go get a degree to do X was far more heretical than it feels today. And when I dropped out of college, I mean, now it, it depends on a lot of cultural things, honestly. Um, and there, you know, folks with different backgrounds um, have very different viewpoints on this. Um, and, but now we certainly notice, you know, and you can see it in survey results, you can see it all over the news. It's not a guarantee anymore. Um, there are, I, I saw something from NBC lately that they did some big survey and 50% of parents of recent college grads are like, yeah, maybe that wasn't worth it. Yeah. And, you know, it, maybe that was true five or 10% of the time now, but to see like, see 50% to see majorities to see like, that's wholly new. Yeah. Um, and, and then the question is, well, what's, what's the alternative, right? Like what is the alternative trade school? Is it nothing? Is it starting a company? And there, you know, I think we're just learning that there are so many paths that are open to folks who, and really our job should be helping students find the right path, not convincing them to take the only path. Um, so that's, that's pretty new, I think. Let's take the listeners down the path of a Bloom Tech uh, participant. What does that look like? We have built something that I think is, is really special, um, where it is both live and supported and fully synchronous, but it flexes to whatever your schedule may be. Um, so, you know, to give one example, it, you may be a stay at home mom who has kids in school from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. who's trying to break into tech. Um, you can actually fully support it, attend Bloom Tech from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. on whatever time zone, and it works beautifully. The school basically molds itself to that schedule. You may be um, you know, just graduating high school and really excited to get into tech and you know, cognizant of the opportunity cost of time um, if you want to go, you know, all in 40, 60 hours a week, you know, in less than six months, you can be, you know, getting a job in, in tech. Um, so it depends on it. We built it. Originally, it wasn't this flexible, but now it is is flexible in the sense that it adjusts to anybody's time and speed of learning and pace basically magically. Um, and it it's still live and synchronous, but it's, it's flexible, which is really pretty unique. Um, so yeah, depending on how many hours a week you want to, to participate and what your schedule is, if you're, if you're full time, basically six months from the day you start our risk-free trial, um, you can be in a tech job. And that's, um, when it comes to payment, you don't uh, need to pay anything up front. Um, most of our students use deferred tuition where you don't um, need to make payments until after you get a you know, well-paying job. And then after that point, the payments are pretty low. Um, so they can be, you know, 500, 600 a month for a few years. Um, and, you know, we try to make it so that that 500, 600 a month, you know, it's not hard to increase what you're earning $10,000 a year or more. And so most people won't even notice it net net, and then mm -hmm. it'll be gone pretty soon. And yeah, that's the, that's the way we, we think of it. You, you take your story, and I said at the beginning of the podcast, you take your story, your path, and you've actually recreated it. Um, and, and now you're looking at you know lower risks um, for the individuals, higher risks. Uh, you have to be accountable. Um, you're working with a lot of partners. Uh, on the previous podcast, you had some heavy hitters uh, that you were working with. Can you say like maybe some of the companies or some of the, the like what are some of the outcomes that some of your students are finding? Yeah, from a partnership side, you know our biggest. Uh, is now Amazon, um, and they hire more engineers than pretty much anybody else and everybody else combined. <laughs> they, they hire a lot of folks at Amazon, turns out. 
Um, but yeah, where our uh, grads are hired, it's difficult to find a company that they are not hired at, actually. Um, so, you know, you pick a company, Fortune 100, Fortune 500, small startup. Um, you know, we've last, to, to give, you, give you an idea, last year alone, we had more than a thousand grads accept job offers. So they're yep. pretty much everywhere. Um, and we like to say that our average, our average student is hired at a company we've never heard of in a place we've never been. So the breadth is pretty, um, pretty compelling. How do you see this moving forward, man? Like, uh, and I know like entrepreneurship mindset, you want to, you know, but what, what is, uh, is there a vision going forward, um, where, uh, Bloom Tech is going to go? The, the way we think about it internally is, you know, the first year or two is kind of getting things set up and established. Uh, the next couple of years to kind of the last two and a half, we're really on iterating, you know, solidifying, making it more accessible. And now what we have is really ready to scale. So we'll be adding a lot of growth. Um, as I mentioned, we, we recently introduced a risk-free trial. So anybody with no commitment, no documents, no credit card, no tuition whatsoever can enroll in Bloom Tech for a few weeks just to see what it's like. We're really, really excited about that. Do so you think there are thousands of people for whom it would be the perfect fit and they just don't know about it yet? Probably millions. Um, we're working on expanding internationally as we speak. Um, but the way we built the product now, it's really pretty simple for us to add more countries, more tracks. We, we really built the machine that gets people from wherever they are to hired in whatever industry um, that they're in, whatever content that they're looking for. And so we're going to be working on scaling that out over the next few years and, you know, getting our, our end goal is to, to help millions of students a year increase their incomes by hundreds of millions of dollars a year. What do you, what do you tell your child like going through what, what advice would you give, you know, anybody going through education right now because it's changing so fast? I'm obviously so in the space. I'm an, an investor in a handful of education companies. I thought about it really deeply. And we have access to anything that we could possibly want access for. Mm -hmm. And we've tr so we've, you know, had the benefit of trying a little bit of everything. She's tried a public school. She's tried a public school with, you know, Portuguese immersion. She's done a charter school. She's done a little bit of homeschooling. And we really, I mean, we're, you know, maybe you have to acknowledge that we're pretty lucky and that we have all those options and that not everybody has all those options, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's a matter of, determining what your goals are and determining what is best for each kid. Um, and we're actually noticing so far that it may be different from our first daughter to our son um, because they, they're just so, they're built so differently <laughs> and they seek such different things. Um, but the one thing I'll say, you know, more broadly, if you're, you know, on the outside looking in, um, and this isn't going to happen as quickly within all the public school system, but in homeschooling and charter schools and not, you know all the other stuff, the impact that technology has is going to be underappreciated for a very long time. And I, I'm not talking about you know putting iPads and Chromebooks in schools, like kind of who cares about that? Um, but the schools that are using adaptive curriculum that you know. Um, will adjust with the speed and learning intensity and interests of the student. Um, I mean, I've you know, been kind of at the forefront of folks who've been experimenting with that stuff for a while. And I mean, we're looking at 10 year olds that are done with all of their high school curriculum and trying to figure out what's next. We're talking about, you know, people who are, you know, median intelligence and IQ that are graduating college at 16. Like there's, there is a world coming that we are not prepared for, and it is not unique to the most expensive private schools. In fact, if anything, it might be the reverse because of the way computing is helping it. Um, so I think, you know, find the places that are able to lean into adaptive software, into adaptive academics, assuming that's what is right for, for your child. And I think we're, we're learning that the track that everybody has been on was necessary given, you know, the constraints of the school systems that we had, but now we're going to see 
pretty wild outcomes happening in K through 12, which is really great. That's why I stay in education. It's like a uh, theme park. That's why it's just, let's go, you know, you find the, yeah. fun, find the fun rides. How can people connect uh, and learn more about Bloom Tech? Uh, yeah, bloomtech.com. Um, you can go there and try out our risk-free trial, see if it's something that you or someone you know would be interested in. Again, there's no tuition requirement, no credit card, no contract, no anything. Just try it out. Um, and then, you know, we're Bloom Tech pretty much everywhere on social and i'm austin on twitter a-u-s-t-e-n thank you so much austin for sharing your story uh you know your personal and your your uh, entrepreneurial journey and frankly for just basically making a a low risk program that's equitable uh for those who really want to go straight in and, and get things done so appreciate you man yeah thank you it's good to good to chat again thank you all for listening to the disrupt education podcast we'll catch you next time